Happy Sabbath to you. What it's happening around the world today is that uh, uh, some people uh, said that it's already uh, we are already in the World War III. So we don't know where the world is going, but we know that God promised that He will come back. And one of the thing that He is talking about is talking uh, about coming and taking His people home. Now. One of the questions that we always had, especially when we look at Revelation, and especially as Adventists, we are talking about 144,000, right? And when we are looking that way, we are thinking that somehow, you know, there will be some remnant people that will be faithful to the Lord. We know that. That's the scripture. However, Jesus uh, also uh, goes deeper and kind of uh, make it more, a little bit more complex. He says that, Brother, brother, broad is the road, right? And many are on it. And narrow is the good one. And few people are in. So that tells me that in the last days, there will be fewer people that are faithful and more that are not faithful. And one of the things that we have to kind of look at is like, what will be the difference between those that are faithful and those that are not faithful? Now, when you look at Jesus, always talk about the separation that the church, his people, have to have versus the world, right? So a, there is a separation between, you know, the, the ethics, the morals of the world, and the morals of the church. And we see, especially in the scripture, Jesus said that in the last days will be, what, like in time of what? Noah, right? And we are looking, and then, you know, Hollywood is taking the story and is running that the flood will come, and you have to have Chinese vessels saving the world, you know. So sometimes, you know, they, they have a kind of a way to interpret things. And, and Peter is very clear that, you know, is, he's saying uh, fire will come, not war, at the end. And I believe that a lot of people are having this concept uh, well established, I'm talking about Christianity in general, when uh, there will be um, a judgment, right? We always have an idea of, of a judgment. And I think Solomon he says, you, you know, you, when you are young, you can do whatever you want it, but keep, be careful because there will be a day of judgment on everything that you did, will be put it before a judge, and you have to figure out something about that. And we always struggle with this idea of judgment. As Seventh-day Adventists, we, we believe that investigative judgment, right? We use that. And we, we believe that that's referring to God's people, right? So when you're looking at judgment, how you feel? No? Okay. Yeah. It's like a, let, let's, let's say we tend to just have a very kind of cold view of judgment. Let me read. Um, if, if you have a Bible... Just open the Bible with me in Revelation. Revelation is talking about the time of judgment. And if you look right there in chapter 20, uh, ver verse 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on him, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. That means for the earth of the earth, you know, the face of the earth in heaven. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the Lord, and books were open, and another book were open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their word, works by the things that were written in the books. So, now, it's interesting because, you know, when you look at the scripture, we tend to just look at and, and take in, Quite literal, right? Uh, so today, do you see heaven having books? Uh, why? Because we start having clouds of information, right? Right now, you put your picture and they go somewhere, right? We call it cloud, right? So um, now that, that opens our imagination to a different way of what is here, books. God has a way where his knowledge is put before the universe that they can find everything that we did in every moment. So what God is doing is 
put, put himself open and say, look at what I know about everyone. Make your own, let's say, judgment. Because everything that God is doing, it's a public display. He's not hiding. So we, we see that. And many times we, we look at a judgment as a very scary thing. And I, I guess that if you did something wrong and you, be, you are before the judge, I think that you should feel that way. But what about Christians? When you are coming before the Lord, what would be your feeling? Are you feeling fear? Are you feeling that you are scared? Are you afraid that something bad will happen to you? And I think, you know, we may have those feelings because we will not understand what the judgment of the Lord is all about. And that takes me to a different book. That's Daniel. And if you look at Daniel chapter 7, I want you to look at from a different perspective of what judgment is. Okay, so, um, and uh, I only invite you that you will just underline or just circle or just put a mark on the Bible about this text because that will take the fear away. Now, we know that Jesus, when he was talking about judgment, he said that those that are believing in me, they pass the judgment. So suddenly, God's people should not be afraid of judgment. So how we should understand judgment? And that's where the text from uh, Daniel chapter 7. And here, verse 22, it says, Until the ancient days come, come. And the judgment was made, what it says right there in your Bible? In a favor, okay? In favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came from the saints possess the kingdom. See, it's like, a, you know, many times we are looking at the judgment only in a negative way. And that's why we tend to be afraid. But here's a, you know, the, the text that is telling us here in Daniel is that the judgment is made in your favor. Now, let's say that you have a relative, or let's make it even more, uh, more close, a spouse, and um, the cop stops you, and you have to go to the judge, and you go before the judge, and it's your husband or your spouse. And you are there, and um, uh, the cop says, well, you know, it's like a, I think there was a suspicious of a foul play, so that's why we are here. Um, you understand that there is a tendency that, you know, the judge will be lenient to his spouse, right? Let's face it. And he will be more closer to accept, you know, the, the plea of the spouse than a, a cop for some reasons. Yeah, we try to just, you know, present the macho type of judgment, you know, judge like Judy or whatever, you know, it's like, a, okay. So, um, but, but keep in mind that, you know, when we come before the Lord, God always will try to put on your side everything that will make your situation much better. So when it comes to, to judgment today, I want you to, to open the scripture with me and Matthew. Matthew, today, will, will, will study a chapter. Okay? Matthew 25. So Matthew 25, it's, a, it's a, let's say, the continuation of uh, Matthew 24, which Jesus is present in the last events. And he's talking about the tribulation, the wars, the social unrest. And we see that today. <coughs> so... Matthew 25 is presenting us three parables. So let's look at over and how those parables could apply to understanding of the selection 
of God's people. So, we start with the first one, which is about ten virgins. How many? Ten. And we already know, and if you look right there, uh, verse 2, it says, Now five, them, five, five of them, they were wise, where five were foolish. Now, if you have to choose yourself, on which one you want to stay? Uh, right? It, it, I think that, you know, we all will try to stay where they are called wise. I like to just be called a wise person, right? A wise virgin. And seems to me that they were wise and foolish, not because of what they have, it's what they did not have. So what was the, the message of those ten virgins? Oil. All right, oil. Now here's the problem. Do you see that right there? 50% are foolish. Can I put it that way? That's a problem right there, okay? Now, we may look at the percentage and we may get the wrong idea, okay? But just keep in mind that Jesus is talking about us. This is not about the world. It's God's people. So, somehow, we are wise or foolish based on a decision. And what is the decision that makes the difference? The quantity of oil. If you look right there, let's uh, let's go very quick, you know very quick through the story. It says those who were foolish, verse three, took their lamps and took no oil with them. That means there is no reserve. Who needs a reserve? Are you when you are going, you know, with your car? Are you taking, you know, the uh, flashlight that has a batteries? and buy some berries that you have it in case that there is a need. We tend to just be very secure that everything will be fine. I can call someone and they will come and pick my car if I'm getting myself in trouble. But suddenly you are getting somewhere where you don't have signal and yeah, and sometimes we are short of uh, understanding mechanics, okay? But that's, that's okay. Here's the thing. The foolish one, they had the light but they have, they consider that they don't need the reserve for, for oil. Why? Because they, they thought that Jesus is coming very soon, the bridegroom. And somehow, maybe that's where we are too, because we're thinking Jesus is coming in AD 88. Hmm? Isn't? Yeah, I'm talking about Seventh Adventists because Millerites were 44, right? So when you look at, we always, we're looking and say, oh, Jesus is coming now, right? And sometimes we prepare ourselves on the short term for the coming of the Lord. We may say that, you know, Jesus will come, you know, before I'm retiring. And then the retirement comes and I don't have enough to kind of have my life, right? Because I didn't prepare for retirement. Uh, you know why uh, Seventh Adventists don't have cemeteries? We have few historical ones. You know why? Yeah, because they believed that Jesus coming before they were going to be dying or dead, being dead. We believe that Jesus is coming. We don't need anything. I imagine if you, you know, have a strong faith that Jesus is coming next month. The thing that you'll take care of your roof anymore. Do you think that, you know, it's like a, you, you'll change the engine from, you know, the broken engine, put a new one, you know? Uh, do you think that you'll go back to the job that you hate for like last five years and you'll say, I'm, I'm happy to be here and work until the end, uh, Jesus is coming. See, because that's exactly what happened in 1844. People kind of give up on everything, property and everything, and they said, oh, well, we are waiting for Jesus. See, the problem with the foolish virgins were that they thought that we have enough for now. Why I need to take too much? You know, oil stains. Yeah, if you work in your car, you, you, you see what's happening in your hands, you know, after you just put your hands around the engine, right? Why? 
because somehow oil is dirty or clean. However, if you have reserve, you have to be very careful because that means that, you know, you can spill it, you can just, you know, have problems. It's, it's like a, it's more than what you wanted. It's make you uncomfortable. It's one thing to hold the, the light with the reserve in it and then have another reserve, right? It's like a, maybe I have other thing that I can carry. Verse 4, wise, the wise ones took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And I will, I will just, you know, go over. We know that all of them were asleep. So those people, the thing that, you know, they are awake and they are just, you know, strong preaching the gospel. Think again, because we are all asleep as a church. And then it's verse 6 says what happened. It's at the midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. This message was not from the inside of the ten virgins. Do you see that? that the, you know, that voice is the voice of people that were with the bridegroom. And what happened is they came up and they were ready to, to go. And then a negotiation between <coughs> the term virgins happened. Uh, they realized that uh, somehow during the time that they were asleep, the, the candles were just, you know, seeping the oil. And suddenly they realized that they have just little of oil. And they said, well, if we are going to go there and meet the bridegroom, we may not have enough oil. Could you just, you know, borrow, you know, just give me, a, lend me, or, you know, few, just a little bit. Uh, and uh, this is what love sometimes is not. Because you see the wise ones, they didn't say, oh, you know, it's like, oh, that's fine, let, let, you know, let's share it. Don't condemn them. Because it's easy to say, why they did not share someone with, how hard is to give a little bit of oil to? Why you are not doing that? Because you, you are living together. You are, you know, you are in the same room. You are, all the people are sleeping. And suddenly you are saying no to a request just because somebody, you know, like a, you know. So if you have to try travels a day and somebody doesn't have enough gas, are you going to just, you know, kind of use a siphon and just take some gas and just give it to other people? Or you are saying, well, the gas is all the way to the travel. I'm not going to give it to you. That will be considered nasty. Not helping. But see, the, the wisdom stays on the principle. And one of the things that, that the, this parable is presenting is whoever is wise are making the right decision. The last thing that I want to mention about this, the ten virgins are not the bride. Just remember that because too many of us, we think that, you know, it's like we are the bride. No, you are not the bride. We are the people, how say the bride, the, what, what do you say about somebody is coming to the wedding, but they are not the bride? Say again? Yeah, well, I don't know. It's like, you know, it's like a, the group of people that are just there, okay, with the bride. All right. So, now, one other thing that, you know, this parable is all about, if you look at the message of the parable, is that, and you'll find that, that, uh, a message in verse 13. It says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. That's the message. So that means be sure that you have reserve for the future. Be wise. And how you do the reserve? It says, uh, Jesus said that if you 
call and ask in my name, God will give the Holy Spirit to you. And many times we, we don't dare to use the Holy Spirit that way. Because there is an issue about the Holy Spirit, and I, I discuss, I will discuss maybe in a different uh, discussion, a different sermon about the fear that we have against the Holy Spirit. Because He's coming and will take control over us. It's not like I'm controlling the Holy Spirit, He's taking over me, and I'm under His control. And that's why we don't want to have so much reserve. I'll give control to the Lord a portion of me, you know, a little bit here. I'll have myself, you know, a little bit there, so I can just have a sense of myself. All right, so this is one of the, the let's say, um, the, let's say the idea that we have to capture from the term virgin. Have enough Holy Spirit. Can I repeat it again? Let me repeat it. You have to have enough the Holy Spirit. Don't ask me how, what is the enough. Because that means every one of us, we have to just have that connection with the Lord. And God has a way to bless us. And He is overflowing His blessing. So He will not just give a portion of it. Just a little bit. He's giving you more than you need. That's, that's one. So be wise. Ask for the Holy Spirit. Have reserve of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we have to recognize the way I sleep. But God is taking care of him, you know, us. And when he's coming, we have to be ready. The second parable that you see it in chapter 25 is the parable of talents. And we have all kinds of stories about that. You know why the person received five talents and the other one received one talent? Well, you know, it's like a, that's what you call predestination. Is that what people are saying? Why, you know, why the, the master had 10 talents, right? Um, I don't know how we can just put it this way. Let's put it a million dollars because it makes more sense for us, right? But it's like, a, you know, uh, let's say that you, somebody has a $10 million and Somebody is giving you five and give two and one million to three people, right? We have the parable. Why you give the five millions to one person and two millions to other and just one million to? Because I'll, I'll be there and it's like, you know, it's like, a, oh, you give me just the one million? See, it's so easy to look at, at bad people, right? And the bad person is the one that gives the money. Because the, you know, the, the, the meaning is somehow the guy that got one talent point the blame to the master, to the owner of the money. Here's what it says. It says, um, verse 24. If you look at verse 24, it says, then he who has received the uh, one talent came and said, Lord, I knew, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not uh, scattered a uh, seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. See, that's exactly, you look at, he's presenting the master as a bad person of, of course it's like i'm afraid of you it's like oh just you know just you are not nice to me is that what we do with people today that's when you project your own inability on other people but i ask you a question i give you i didn't give you an answer right why the guy received five and the other one received just one well, to understand that, you have to look at verse 15, because we have the answer right there. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, another one, to each according to what it says, their abilities. And that means it's about who you are, how much you want to receive, are able to receive. So it's not the master that's, let's say, 
uh, let's say, um, making a, a decision, right? Executive decision. Uh, I don't like you. I don't like you. Okay, I give this because, you know. No, it's because of who you are. So what, what is the, the message from the parable of the talents? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But one of the things is how you use your talents. See, because you are not going to heaven if you are not using your talents. Let me make it even more, you know, because we tend to, you know, talents and talents seems to me that it's kind of, you know, um, they were referring a, a, like a, a weight of gold. And today we are reflecting on the parts of a character or just, you know, um, part of who we are, you know, what we have. You have a talent to sing. I have a talent to write. I, you have a talent to, you know, and everyone has a talent. You know what Ellen White is talking about talents? What's the most important talent that we all have? See? see? No? Time. Okay, that's, that's one, but you are very close. Yes, that's true. But see, you know, we're talking about, you know, what we have. Talents is what you have to share. Many times, you know, we are looking, you know, uh, the good things or my character. This has nothing to do with what you have. It's what you share with people. Ellen White in uh, Christ Object Lesson, the biggest talent. It's influence. Influence. You have influence over everyone around you. From your spouse, from your children, from your neighbors, co-workers, church members, society. You have, that's what salt is. I find, the, you, know, uh, you know, that you have some of the quotes that are coming that are more funny. And this is, my wife is, is good on finding things, She's just send me, sharing with me. So it's like, a, this is what was the quote. If we're supposed to be the salt of, salt of the earth, right? Why we try to sugarcoating everything? And I was thinking, it's like, you know, whoever make that, it makes sense, right? Because we don't want to put salt on the wounds, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you don't want to make it salt being sugar. So God is giving you salt and you're trying to just put sugar in the drinks of people. And we, we try to cover ourselves and say, oh, we have to be nice to people. Okay. But just, you know, be sure that who you are, okay? So what we are looking at the 10, you know, 10 talents is that you have to use your talent. Not only that, but it's like you have to have a return on your talent. How we call a return in a capitalistic society? That's true, but it's, there is a name. It starts with P. Profit, that's correct. That's correct, profit. So you have to have a profit. But the profit is not for you. It's for the master, because actually what happened, is the one that had two talents and five talents, they return on investment like 100%, right? It was just five talents, they got five more. Got two, he got two more. Now, what the story is telling us that the master is not taking their money. Do you see that, that story? How many talents the, the one that received five had at the end? Wrong. Eleven. Why? Because not only that he got the profit, but he got the one talent that was hidden in the ground by the one that received just one. It was given to the one that had five. Why, you know, the master did not divide that talent and said, you, you that you have five, will give you 50% of the talent, and the other one that had two will give you the half. Because, you know, it's like, and that tells you something, that God blessed those people that are using the most of the talents. More than, you know, other people. 
And it's not because God wants, you know, to bless or he's subjective, right? Or has a favoritism to, you know, to certain people. He is just giving more to people that are using more. So what's your talents today? Hmm? Because if, you know, we may just look at, we may just say that, oh, I don't, you know, I'm not doing anything. All right. So what do you do? You, you dig a, a hole, you know, in the back of the house and the yard and just put your talent over there and say, ah, you know, I'm looking around. It's like, a, hey, give me just one. Yeah, right. We all do that. So the reality is that one of the difference between people is how you use your talents. And the, this parable is speaking about God's people. This is not about the world. It's for us today. So when you look at it and uh, you're kind of uh, back of your mind, how many talents you receive? Well, at least do you know that you receive the talents? Are you using those talents? Because that's the, the idea. You know, those that are using the talents, they will go further. Those that did not use the talents, they will not cross the line. Okay, so we have foolish ones that are not crossing the line, right? They are not received. And then we have one that had talents, but he didn't use it. He's not there. So let's look at, at the third kind of a situation. And I know that we are not, uh, you know, I, I used to, you know, live at what is called a big city. So for us, the only time that we can just see animals was when I'm going to my grandma or some relative that was just in a village. And talking about, uh, you know, it's like a, um, the birds that covered the hints. I think that, you know, Christine said that in the Sabbath. But um, there, there was this hen that has a, you know, black and white kind of uh, feathers. And I really like it. So I was trying to just, you know, catch her, just hold it. But I was running and she was running and she was running and I was, you know, running till there, uh, there was a moment that kind of give up. So she would just sit right there. So I would go there and just pet her for a while till she would get her a little bit of strength and just she would run away. So the only thing that, you know, I'm talking about animals many times doesn't make sense to us with what it's in the scripture. So but. Let's read, uh, you know, a little bit about the third parable. It says, verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. When Jesus will sit on the throne of glory? Uh, by this text. When He's coming. Okay? So I will break your mind a little bit with this text because, you know, it's like a, uh, we, we tend to have our own kind of a, uh, lineage of events. And this is kind of breaking that because it says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and that means the second coming of Jesus. Okay? And all His holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. And all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another. As the shepherd divides his sheep from what? Hold on a second. Is this, you know, sheep and goats are, sheep are good people and goats are the bad people? Do you think that that's a, so if you want to just, you know, choose, which one you'll choose? Goats? Sheep? Let me, let me break it to you. You know that, you know, sheep are very stupid animals. It's considered. Everybody, you know, I talked to, they said, Okay, sheep, really? I like goats. You, you know why? Why people like goats? Oh, they are very independent, strong minded. They always jump on the fences and, you know, look at trees everywhere. It's like, a, especially when they're young, they are jump, jumping like, a, you know, they're so funny. I like them. The problem is that, you know, God is telling us that when He's coming, He will have a problem with the separation of the two types of people. But here's the thing, this is not about the world. Again, this is about God's people. 
That means it's about us. And some of us will be goats and someone will be sheep. Did I mention what sheep are called, right? They say, I have the same problem. Because, you know, people say, really? You are not narrow-minded? It's like a sheep, really? Obedience without understanding? Who will choose to obey? We have, a, you know, the song, Trust and Obey, right? And it's like, a, we, we, you know, and one of the problems that I, when I was talking to people, is the people are just saying, I don't know if I have to obey everything. And it's like, a, should I, you know, have my opinion about things? Well, you, you can have your opinion. We are talking about, you know, uh, lordship uh, and the Sabbath school. And uh, we have to keep in mind that lordship is a very serious matter. Today, it seems to me that we accept Christ as a Savior, but when it comes to being Lord, our lives kind of, you know, check out that. We don't want it. So he's doing this. And how you divide and how you know, because see, I set you up. Okay? Because I, what I said about the sheep, oh, yeah, because it's kind of, you know, minimum thinking, just obedience. Here's the thing, because now we know how heaven will make the difference, how God will make the difference between those people that are sheep and people that are goats. Because it says, and he will set the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left, right? So we see the separation. Then the king will say to those that are on the right side, that means to the sheep, listen what they says, come, you bless of my, blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. So the sheep will receive the kingdom of heaven. Really? I thought that, you know, independence, you know, creativity is the best thing. Leadership. That's what we wanted. Isn't that what we say today? Everybody's a leader. So... Jesus is talking about to the sheep and said, come because to you is given the kingdom of heaven. It must be that God is biased. He likes sheep. Okay? But just listen. It says, verse 35, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you come to me. Oh, I, I think that, you know, now we know. Sheep are those that are doing things. He's not saying, oh, because you are fat and you are having a certain weight, you are good. Or you give, give a lot of wool. No. And... By the way, since you are not talking too much, it's even better because, you know, sheep are just, you know, they are, they are just obedience, right? Here's the thing. The sheep are the ones that are doing something. What they are doing? Oh, they are giving food. They are doing, you know, uh, drink. They, they give clothing. They are visiting people. They go to hospitals. They, you know, prison and everything else. But there is something else. Because the sheep are talking. Because, they see, that's the beauty of the parables, right? Animals are talking back. Oh, there was a time in the scripture, this funny, when the donkey is talking. And it was not a parable, okay? So, uh, it says, that, verse 37, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, I know, it's like, you know, it's like, I like what the scripture is saying. It says that the, you know, the, the righteous will answer him. They were asking him in a way, right? He was saying, you know, they said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you, thirsty and give you drink? When did we see a stranger take you in and naked and clothing in? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? I think that that's a kind of a direct question. You know, it's like, a, okay, when did we do this? You know what that tells me? 
the sheep were doing it not because they kind of uh, keep a journal and just you know you know what I'm doing and they were not coming to the church and say oh look it's like I did you know 10 visits what about you because they will not remember when they did it this is a quality of a sheep and that's why Jesus is going there, because they were doing it because there was something inside of them. What about the, the goats? He says, verse 41, depart from me, you cursed. See, um, today we, we think that, you know, only the blessings are in the scripture. Let me uh, put it very clearly that cursing, curse or Cursing is still in the Bible. If you look at the blessing and the cursing that it's in the, in the books of Moses, it's, they are still valid today. Some people think that, you know, it's like only the blessing because they are positive thinkers. Okay? Good. But here's the thing. A curse will, will be put upon the goat. And it says, depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you give me no food. I was thirsty, give you no drink. And he goes right there. I was a stranger, didn't take me naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick, in prison, and you didn't visit me. Here's the problem. They said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty? Or a stranger, naked? See, the issue is that the goats are looking and said, I don't remember that I saw anyone in need of that. Especially you, Lord. Yes, Mark. And they're saying, uh, like the hungry, uh, the physically hungry or hungry for the word of God. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty for it? Something to drink? Are you thirsty for the word of God? People come up to you, they're hungry. Uh, they're hungry for, uh, they're in trouble at that time of their lives. Well, if you look at right now, you know, it's like a, look, there are two types of helping someone based on the scripture. One, it's a physical needs. And we know that when Jesus came, he addressed that physical need. But, you know, all the miracles that Jesus did, he was not taking only the physical suffering. He was taking the spiritual suffering, too. So when he was doing the healing, he healed the, the flesh and the spirit at the same time. And this is what it's missing in our life today. Because we may be a Bill Gates that give food to Africa, but if there is no spirituality. We just, you know, give because we are good people. The issue here is not, the, you know, if you are a good person or not. If you are a one that are doing that because or in his name or not. Because we can do, you know, what uh, uh, Paul says in the first Corinthians. I can give my body... You know, as a sacrifice, but will not count. So you can, you can just take all your wealth and say, Lord, you said to the rich man that, you know, I have to sell and give it to the poor. Give it to them. But that will not count anything toward your, you know, salvation. Why? Because salvation is not coming to what you're doing. It's by the obedience that you have. Because here's the thing. He says, that's the response of Jesus in verse 45. I surely I say to you, in, in as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So let's address one of the issues here. So this parable tells us that the difference between the goats and the sheep is what you do in the church, in the society, around you. It's like a, and the issue is that if you do this for you, then it stays for you. Because Jesus said, whoever receives, you know, the, the applause of people on this earth, 
They already received the benefits of that. You're not going to have anything in heaven. So doing things, and we are focusing on uh, doing things. Here's the thing. Do you understand that all those three parables are coming together? So there is not, you know, you cannot just give food to the people or do something to people, visiting people, and you think that you'll go to heaven because you are a sheep. You have to obey God. You have to just use your talents. You have to just be wise and have the Holy Spirit that will lead you because the Holy Spirit will take you to a person that in need. The Holy Spirit will bring a person in your life that you, you have to realize that that's an opportunity for you to reach out to that person spiritually and physically. Because James says that you can pray to people and say, God bless you and go along because, you know, we pray for you. I see today, most of the time when something bad happened, the government is saying, well, you know, our prayers are with the family of the victims. Really? One, that you are taking God out of school and out of the society. Then you are saying praying. It's like a, it's a magical words praying. To whom you pray? To Hindu? To Buddha? Really? But it's nice, okay? So we try to be nice. Now, being nice, one thing, doing the right thing is. But that's a total thing. Because the reward... It's heaven. However, you are not receiving reward because of what you did. It makes the difference between those people that are faithful to God and those people that are not faithful to God. So do not take by saying, oh, I'll start, you know, doing something today because then I know that I'll be a sheep. Having the sheep characteristics is not in what they do. It's who they obey. Again, it says, look, it's like a... I'll read again verse 4 because I didn't read it at that time. And it says, And the king will answer and say to the sheep, right? It says, As surely I say to you, in as much as you did it to one of the least of those, my brother, you did it to me. It's extraordinary that Jesus could identify with somebody in need. That doesn't mean that, you know, you have, uh, you know, people on the street. And, uh, you know, it's like a, when you go to Auburn, you probably you already know that there are corners where people are just begging right there. And we try to just, you know, try to work something out of the church over there so we can supply some needs to people. They don't like vegetables. They don't like food. They don't like drink. They don't like anything but cash. And then suddenly, you know, there are certain other issues right there. Now, here's the, the problem. Now, I ask people, it's just like, you know, it's like, are you still feel comfortable to help people? Well, you know, some people say, well, the government is doing a pretty good job. They, they have shelter, they have things. Yeah, but that's not the question. It's like how you help people. How you help people. And one of the issues of, you know, the difference between goats and sheep is not about leadership in the church. It's not about who's greater in the church. It's not, it's who's doing the right thing. And you are not doing it because you are going to be saved, but it's a package. So chapter 25, it's a package of three parables that brings together the characteristic of those that will be put at the right of the hand of the Lord. That means that they will receive the eternity, the kingdom of heaven. So I'll repeat. Be wise. Make reserve of the Holy Spirit. This is not an easy task. So don't, don't think it's like, oh, I'll go there in the market and just buy it. I know that it says right there that, you know, the, you know but you, you'll not find it at Hannaford, Okay. So you have to know where you have to go. And you have to ask the right thing. Ask the Lord to have the Holy Spirit. Yes, Joe. That's correct. But you know, it's like God has, has 
a way to reach out to us because it's so easy. I'll say it's so easy that those, you remember, you know, one of the, the more, let's say, deep thinking is, uh, and I'll just put it right there, when it comes to ten, the ten virgins, do you know something? Here's what it says. says verse 10, and while they were went to buy the bridegroom, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. As, afterward, the other virgin came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Let me, let me put this way. There is a timing that you have to receive the Holy Spirit. Because those ten foolish ones went and bought the oil. But the door was closed for them. Do you see the problem? Because there is a timing when you have to have the Holy Spirit. You can just, you know, do miracles. You can preach the gospel. You can give your soul to the gospel, right? But if you are not doing God's timing, there is no open door for you. The foolish one... You know the difference between smart people and foolish ones? Actually, there is no difference because they will get to the same conclusion. But they will get to the same conclusion at different times. So you tell people that, you know, let's say uh, there will be a famine, like Joseph in the scripture. You remember the, the dream? And people say, no, no. But then seven years back, you know, later, you have a famine. They didn't prepare. You get to the same conclusion that there is a famine, but the result of that will be different because, you know, it's like you don't prepare, you're not doing anything, you dismiss it. How many people are believing that Jesus is coming? You ask people on the street, they believe that Jesus is coming. The problem is when he's coming. You know, people say, oh, yeah, it's like, you know, 100, 200, 300, you know, it's like, that means not in my lifetime. They are not prepared to receive Jesus today. And when the door shuts, which is the, uh, let's say, how we call the door shut? Mm, yep, yeah, but it, it's similar to what happened in no ark, right? That's, well, that's true. It's the end of probation, it's called. As an Adventist, right? We'll call it. That means that once that door is closed, nobody could come in. And it's not because they are not faithful. It's because if they are coming, they are received. They are received because the fear of eternity being condemned or cursed, like it says in the scripture. So they want to just be with Jesus, not because they love him. It's because of the consequences. And that's no different than Judas coming and saying, oh, you know, it's like I sinned. He was not crying because he was horrified by the sin. He was crying of the condemnation that comes because of sin. So today, we have three stories. And if you look at, I always tend to play with numbers, right? It, and my mind, you know, seems to me that that is like 50%, right? Because you can see right there a few times where... Jesus talked about two people will sleep in the same bed. One will be taken, one will be left, right? Two people being filled, one will be taken, one will be left. And then we have ten virgins, five it's, it's wise, they are wise, and, and five are... Do you, see, do you see my problem? But don't be fooled by numbers. Because the ten uh, talents has nothing to do with the numbers. The, the sheep and the goats is not talking about numbers. It's a choice that you have to make. So today, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this this way. The, the story of the sheep and the goats, it's about serving others. So we are talking about talents, and that means how you, uh, let's say, use your talents to bring other people. Or just develop that, right? It's like a bring profit we, we mentioned, right? And then we have the story of the ten virgins. And they are wise and foolish. I think that, you know, that kind of uh, tell you where you are, right? 
And you have to make a choice yourself what you want to be. You want to be a sheep? You want, because making, you know, being a sheep, it's a choice. Don't tell me that, you know, it's like a, yeah, I'm coming from the lineage of sheep or I'm coming the lineage of goats. That's not the story. You know, Jesus presented that because there are some characteristics that the sheep and the goats are having. And you have to choose. And among us, there'll be some people that'll receive a talent. There'll be two talents and five talents. So what's the, the lesson of, this, of the story? If you got the talent, what do you have to do? Just use it. Not only that, but use it in such a way that you can make a moral difference than the one that has five talents. And when it comes to ten virgins, what do you have to do? Pray. Because there is no way that you can just have the Holy Spirit without praying to the Lord to give it to you. There is nothing that you can do to gain more or reserve of the Holy Spirit than prayer. Do you see the difference between those people that are received to the kingdom and the one that are not receiving the kingdom? Because they live together. They live together. And what I would say is like a, a, you have to just make a choice who you want to be. That's your choice. It's not the master choice. Don't try to blame like the one with the reset talent. Oh, I was afraid of you. You know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm coming every Sabbath. I will give my tie. I will do this. I will do this. You know, because I'm afraid of you. Do you see the judgment? That's a judgment that we bring upon ourselves. That means, you know, it's like a, Paul says that our conscience, when you come before the Lord, our conscience will condemn us or not. Second um, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whatever good or bad. So, so you can see that the scripture is telling us that the time is coming and we have to just be sure um, what's happening in our own life. What are the decisions? Um, and uh, and uh, the last text that I have is Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Uh, verse 2. Uh, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according truth to truth against those who practice such things. So, look. Judgment is a reality. But we should not be afraid of judgment because God will always will put a lot of things in your favor, in our favor. He's trying to work with us. What do you have to do? Pray, be obedient, and use influence, right? To your talents. Use everything that you have that you, pray, you know, glorify God's name. I hope that, you know, today we'll make a choice, each of us, in such a way that God will be pleased. And he will say to us, come in, enter the kingdom, because you are a good servant. Loving Father, we come before you to praise you of your promise that you are coming. And we know that you are coming very soon. So Lord, today, as we are looking at the word of the scripture and yours, Lord, help us to understand that we don't know the hour when you are coming, but we pray. Please, Lord, work in our lives that we can be prepared for you, for waiting for you, that we will do whatever necessary, that uh, we will qualify to go to heaven in a sense of receiving you in our heart and seeing you and everyone that needs help. Help us, Lord, today that will change our hearts and we become better people, serving you better, because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.